Der nächste Vortrag ist von Joana Brunowicka. Da. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much uh, to Elke and Volker for inviting me, and thank you for these wonderful talks, especially the last one that shows this tech for communities and, and, and really for public good. Um, my name is Janna Bronowicka, and I am originally from Poland. And in winter 2012, I was in Warsaw. I was working for uh, the Reuters agency as a journalist reporting on the financial markets, including the, the Greek crisis and the looming Brexit. And at the same time, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of Polish people on the streets protesting against uh, the ACTA agreement. I think you maybe remember um, that we had these big protests in Poland and it was actually both from the left and the right wing. It was the big spirit of, uh, of anti-big corporations and we were sitting there in the newsroom and we just decided to that it was not important, <laughs> that we're not going to report it, that it was just, you know, young people jumping on the streets. Uh, and then it later turned out that it was actually the sign of a turn of a tide of, uh, of really against um, big tech corporations and that the Polish government had to back off and that we, um, we actually managed to stop ACTA. Um, and I was quite optimistic uh, at the time. I actually joined the Ministry of Digital Affairs in Poland and I was working on policies such as open government and uh, general data protection regulation. And I really believed that with technological solutions we can open up democracy and, um, and that you know, we can come up with data protection regulations that are good for both the consumers and the users and, and the companies at the same time. Um, but of course, uh, in 2014, we had the, the Snowden revelations <laughs> and then my enthusiasm really changed. And that was also when I, when I arrived in Berlin. And I have uh, been living in Berlin, so I, this is my community. I've, I've been working at, as, uh, at the European University of Adina as the director of Center for Internet Human Rights. And I've been doing research, so I, I moved more on the research side. I really saw, as, uh, as somebody who was working on digital policy, that it's very important to collect evidence uh, when we're making these policies. But of course, um, it, is also, it was also a time of reckoning that when I realized that um, surveillance is not something that is happening in authoritarian regimes outside of the EU, that it is, in fact, um, European governments that are increasingly um, resorting to surveillance measures veiled under counter-terrorism measures, uh, but that also that we are really, um, you know, this surveillance capitalism is not it's not the sharing economy that's the song of the day that that really um, that really except for the general data protection regulation governments and politicians are not doing much um, to to regulate technology and that um, I think we saw that last week that the power over these important decisions are in the wrong hands, that they're ha in the hands of people that did not listen to the people that were on the streets, that I think that they made their voices quite clear what they thought about the copyright directive and Article 13. Um, and I don't, you know, I think that some of them are maybe unable because of uh, not understanding technology fully. Uh, and some are clearly unwilling because they know um, whose interests would be hurt and they're definitely uh, listening to, to lobbyists. So I think that uh, what I learned over these last couple of years is that it's really not about the choice between the, the utopia and, and dystopia, but really proposing a more realistic vision uh, of where the, the future of technology could go and, and as it's advancing, making sure that it's advancing for social good and that it's not about any single issue like privacy or like copyright or it's not about specific solutions like 
uh, open government or Bitcoin, but it's really about the choosings, about of the which choosing the goals that these solutions will serve. And I and I really believe as a as one of uh, these pro-European Union people that this is the right uh, dimension where we should uh, be solving um, these issues. So. Today I want to talk about the New Deal for Technological Sovereignty. It is a policy that was developed by uh, people uh, from DiEM25, from this, this pan-European movement. Some of them maybe are here today. Um, actually, uh, we I will just be foreshadowing what's in this program because the real reveal of this program will be on May 5th um, here in Berlin. So you're very much invited to this event. And in DiEM25, we really we started a discussion about how to democratize technology uh, by organizing a very democratic process so anybody could really participate in this spontaneous democratic collective on technology solutions. And this is already a third version of a green paper that will be released, so you can read the previous ones. And this is, you know, constant reiterative process where um, maybe every year we will be collecting um, solutions to see uh, what could be included and how it could be improved. And the main problem identified in the paper, I think is one that you're all familiar with, um, which is the monopoly power of uh, corporations. And the second one is the automated decision maker making, which is often sold to us as some advance in um, artificial intelligence. But in, in the nutshell, the problem is that um, as the technology is advancing, um, the cost is socialized, whereas the, the profits un are privatized. I think that probably you're, uh, you're familiar with these concepts with that um, we need innovations for the for the common good, like, like we saw, and that we need to design systems which are inclusive and reflect the diversity of our society, including women and marginalized communities. Um, what I would like to talk about is uh, concrete uh, solutions uh, that we could implement, as I said, it's a realistic vision that we could re implement already in the next European Parliament. Uh, these are, we definitely need regulation and um, GDPR is a step in the right direction, but we need to use our antitrust enforcement to simply big, break big corporation up, and we need uh, to strengthen our privacy regulation f further. Um, but regulation is not enough, we need also renewal, we need to invest in building a shared digital commonwealth, and that could happen through uh, decommodifying data through public data commons, um, but also by investing, supporting structures for data-driven innovations, for example, platform co-ops, and, um, and also by establishing uh, a digital rights uh, framework for citizens. For example, right to repair was mentioned already today. So, I want to talk about um, extraction because I think we are uh, also quite familiar with the idea of data extraction and the business model which is based on the fact that we, we are the, the resource, our personal data is the resource that is uh, extracted and this is how profit is made. But there's another form of extraction which is the, um, the one that's particularly important to me and this is the extraction, uh, extraction of data from people at their workplace. Um, and I'm talking about the data that's actually generated by the workers on the job. Um, this is not something, o o not only they're not compensated for it, but when um, they are actually training the robotic replacement that, that will be, um, that will take their jobs, potentially. But I think what's even worse, which is actually not this futuristic perspective, but this what is happening now, is that this data is used to control them. And um, the, the way that technology uh, in the workplace is advancing is that the, the, the employers are looking for new ways to, to control employees and to consolidate the existing power imbalances and existing um, hierarchies. 
So perhaps for some people it's too strong, but for me it's, I call it um, data slavery, uh, because there is this really strong already existing power imbalance between the um, employers and workers, and this is really something that is making it worse. So um, this challenge, I think, is not on the radar of the decision makers at all. Um, yet uh, we have conducted at the Center for Internet Research, uh, for the Center for Internet Human Rights, this project called the App as Your Boss, and we just decided to go and talk to people who, whose life very much depends um, on on this kind of um, workplace. So we talked by to um, the food delivery uh, riders uh, from Deliveroo and Foodora. You might have seen them on the bikes here. Uh, and uh, I'm talking about companies like Uber, like Deliveroo, everywhere where, uh, where I think these companies are selling something like a promise of autonomy at the workplace. And not only I'm not talking only about the fact that they are uh, often self-employed contractors, but also that they are using the app and that there's no boss. Um, and there's this freedom that you can work whenever you want and that you can reject an order or a ride whenever you want. So, so I think for, for a lot of people, this is something that is instinctively appealing, not having a boss. Um, and this is something that, that is perhaps desirable. Um, but what it turns out when we talk to writers at Deliver and Fedora is that this very quickly becomes this becomes obvious that it's not the case. So what is actually happens is that um, it's not only that the massive amounts of data are used to um, that are produced by the workers are used to optimize the algorithms that are just designed for profit and not to make sure that um, that this is a decent job. It is also that this data is collected to um, compile statistics about the performance of each and uh, every one of these workers. And these stats, as the writers refer to them, um, are really um, make it or break it for, for, for a lot of writers. Why? Because based on the statistics, there is an automated decision-making mechanism which sorts the writers into three categories. Uh, three badges, and only the top category of riders can choose uh, which, uh, like the top category of the riders gets the first pick of when they will be working, which time slots uh, are most convenient to them. If you're in the second badge, then you ha you book your shifts an hour later. If you're in the third badge, because your statistics were bad, because you missed shifts, or you rejected too many orders, then you're really left with very few options and that autonomy that was promised is gone and actually what ends up happening is that people try to improve their statistics so they end up working actually a lot more and the, the, this, this technology, this whole system based on automated decision making becomes just a way of intensifying labor in a way that, that we know from maybe um, the industrial early industrial times. So this is really not just in the in the food sector. This is of course also in the ride sharing apps like Uber or in taxis which use similar systems, but it's uh, similar in call centers. We're right now doing a project about um, call centers where these kind of uh, mechanisms are used. And um, and of course in warehouses, places like um, the, the Amazon Logistics Center where where people really control through these statistics and, and very high norms. So, um, what can we do about this? Um, of course, there is one solution which is quite popular, is that we could treat all the self-employed people as workers, and through by treating them as workers, they would be able to unionize and organize strike and fight for their rights. Um, there's a lot of resistance to recognizing them as workers because theoretically they have time, they have option to choose when and where and where they will work. But uh, but we claim um, that the integration into the app uh, is equal to integration into organization. And in fact, 
courts have ruled in Spain and France that uh, that indeed the fact that this disciplinary mechanism that I described to you is enough to consider them workers. So I think we should make a much stronger case for recognizing all platform workers as um, as workers and not self-employed people. But there's another thing because we cannot just wait for court rulings and we cannot just, you know, uh, think of solutions that are specific to speci to to a given workplace. I think that we should think bigger. We should think about ways that we could mainstream. Um, a different logic, just in similar way that we were thinking about privacy by default or privacy by design when, when we were thinking about GDPR, that we should really have privacy by, by default and privacy by design in the workplace where um, when these techno the social technical systems are developed uh, and before they're implemented, there is an input, there is a voice from the workers that's heard, and that's either through you know some co-design mechanisms or by simply coming up with standards which are already based on, on existing privacy laws and labor laws where we would, um, we would just set standards that have to be met before a technology used in the workplace is, uh, is rolled out. So I would also uh, say that maybe we need a special new legislation, which is something like data protection uh, for the workers. Uh, that would really s uh, that would be one of the ways uh, of going further with the GDPR. I don't know if you know, but at the moment GDPR actually does not cover workers. I mean, it says that data processing of of workers uh, data uh, data process processing of the workers' data that's produced in the workplace is possible as long as it's necessary. And of course it's necessary if the employer thinks that it's gonna increase their profit. So, so really there is no, um, there's no uh, way that a worker could say no to, to data processing. I mean, they can, there's right to information, but that's not the same thing as, as, um, as withdrawing from the system. So we really need stronger regulation against profiteering from workers' data. And that would also complement the long-term measures such as the growth of platform cooperatives or establishing uh, public data commons. But how do we make sure that these solutions are implemented? And we at DM25 decided that, uh, that it would be very important that we use the upcoming European Union, European Parliament elections in May um, to build um, to build coalition that includes both the the DM25 movement, but also political parties across European Union, which are sympathetic to this cause. And actually, what m what we managed to do is to c build a coalition of uh, parties. And actually, I'm from a Polish party, Razem. Um, and here in Germany, it's a party, it's a new party called Demokratie in Europa. Uh, but as you can see, there are parties from uh, many European countries. And with the DM25 um, people, we are together in this coalition called the European Spring. And what is very unique about this is that we have one program. And this, what I described for you, to you as the New Deal for Technological Sovereignty, that's also included in the program. And whether, wh when I know, talk to my, um, uh, my colleagues from Portugal or France or Greece, I know that they stand for the same values. And this is actually quite, uh, quite a special feeling because we finally not only developed this program together, but now we can use it as a starting point for, um, for further discussions. Um, so this is really something that um, that I think is going to make our movement stronger, no matter what the electoral result is. But of course, uh, I would encourage you to cons to to check to check us out. And Yanis Varoufakis is going to be number one in Germany. We also have Bianca Pretorius on number four. She's German. She's also a tech enthusiast and an entrepreneurship supporter. Um, but I don't want to say just, you know, uh, to vote for us. I think that we then you need to do more, as in we need to build very, very wide coalitions to make sure that these ideas, which I think by now for many people are common sense, 
uh, really become reality. So, um, so maybe if you could think also of of your own parties or the ones that you voted for, and if you're really not willing to 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 switch to vote for Democratia in Europa, um, I think that that what happened in the European Parliament last week really shows that that we have our base. Uh, which is more or less on the left side of the spectrum, but it's the middle that we really have to fight for, that we really need to make sure that everybody makes a switch from this you know, digital agenda for Europe, which is just a project on based on competition and, and, and profit, um, to something like a shared uh, digital Europe where we're really treating technology as a way of advancing the common good. So my... My appeal would be actually to uh, to to leave the social the to leave the filter bubbles that we are usually in and use the fact that that elections are times where a lot of people are paying attention, they're acquiring new information, and that we could leave our circles of experts and activists and people that we usually talk and maybe leave the online space and go on the streets and talk to our friends and families about technology, which is, I think, has become in the last couple of years a really common concern. Um, and I think that this is also a time where you can get new people excited about causes and make sure that new people participate in the political process. So this is what um, that we're trying to do with GM25. And of course, if you're interested in, in technology specifically, you can join our May 3rd event or you can join the technology collective. But, but I, I, would, I, I actually, in my, in my own campaign, I was thinking about what I could do as a Polish migrant living in, in Germany. And then, I don't know if you know, but there are actually 4 million EU uh, citizens living in Germany that are eligible to vote. So I started with a campaign that w really helped to build coalition with also other political parties that care about these voters, where we are uh, encouraging and informing people about the right um, to vote and the fact that they have to register, because there's a deadline on May 5th um, that the EU citizens have to go to their own city hall to register. And now, right now, we're, we're using this campaign also to build new you know, to reach out to people that maybe uh, otherwise wouldn't have voted or didn't know. And this is really something that um, I would like to leave as the final message, um, that, that this is really, this next two months that are coming up is the time that we should try to leave our bubbles and maybe talk to our friends and family. Maybe you have, you know, EU citizens living in Germany that you could ask them if they know that they can register to vote until May 5th. Um, or maybe, you know, some parents that are worried about the impacts of technology on their kids, uh, but don't know what the EU could do about it. Um, or maybe you could talk to your friends uh, if they know how their data is processed at work. Also talk to women and marginalized communities if they have been um, victims of an automated decision making. I think that this is really, this is really a time to make the discussion about technology not just uh, among ourselves, among the policy experts, activists, but really make it, if we want to make technology for the many and not the few, we have to make it with the many and not just with the few. Thank you very much. <laughs> and if you... Thank you, Joanna. Does anyone have any questions? Thanks, that was like a super interesting talk and I would really love to go to the event on May 5th. Um, I have like a clarification, I guess. I'm sure that's what you meant, but for the others who might not work um, in the law sector or GDPR, um, which is when we were talking about GDPR not including workers, Obviously, workers are also included, their personal data is also protected, but just the same way as it is the case for every normal person. So there's no extra law saying this specifically applies only to workers yet, but we do take into account that there is a hierarchy between the worker and the employer, and then if we take into account is this consent really free 
from the worker, we will have to take into account there's a hierarchy, so his consent might not be as free. And that's something that we will review when we see is this consent free or not. So that's which I would like to clarify for the people who haven't worked with this. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to make one correction. This is on May 3rd and not May 5th, sorry. <laughs> And also another thing is, if you uh, if you want to take a look here, um, I have the leaflets about the registration for EU voters and our new de deal for technology and a newsletter. So if you want to circulate this. Thank you. Are there any more questions or comments? If I could just say something about the, the data protection for workers. There's another catch-22 there, which is that says that workers can have a voice uh, about technology used in the workplace, but the, but they have to resort to what is called the national mechanisms of co-determination. And what does it mean? It means that uh, if you have a workers' council, works council in your workplace, or if you have a union, that the use of technology in the workplace can become subject of negotiations or of a collective agreement. But we have to understand that in many of the workplaces that we're talking about, there are no works classes, there are no unions. This is very precarious work where uh, there's a lot of migrants. It's very difficult to unionize people that are constantly rotating in and out of these jobs. And when we're talking about European Union regulation, we also have to think of countries like Poland, for example, uh, and a lot of Eastern Europe where unions are very weak. So saying that you have to go, that the only way that a workers can have a voice is through a union is like saying, okay, well, only in places where there are unions, they will have a voice. So this is, I think, wha also why we should have, we should harmonize these, uh, these rules. Yeah, also a big thank you from my side for the great um, sharing of your activities. And I want to ask you, when showing the last picture and showing you on the streets talking to the people, um, how do you address your agenda and your goals to the people? How do you speak to them? And which topics are relevant for them? What is the feedback you get? This is a very interesting question, actually. Uh, so I have a little bit of experience in politics because I run for member of parliament uh, in 2015 in Poland. And of course you do a little bit of profiling and targeting. <laughs> and when you talk to people, uh, I think in, in Germany right now, uh, the Green New Deal and, and talking about uh, climate policy is just really strong because I think currently in the Bundestag, there are no parties that are fulfilling the ambitions that are put forward, for example, by the students on the streets. But it's also a policy that can talk about how investing in technology and investing in people can create jobs and growth. So I think this is a very good topic. I personally talk a lot to people who work uh, in jobs that are just bad jobs, where they're, uh, they don't have much protections, they feel incredibly insecure and unstable, and then talking about work. And I think you know it's, it's quite easy to ask somebody, hey, um, what do you think about your job? And then at least Polish people have a knack for complaining, so it's easy to complain. Uh, and then when you start complaining and okay, you're understanding a little bit the working situation, and I mean, the labor market is completely destroyed by precarious contracts, fake self-employment, subcontracting chains where you don't know who's responsible. So it's really easy from work to talk about either technology actually or about talking about how labor law laws are not protect protecting people enough and how there's lack of stability and who's responsible for, for the lack of stability. And then I think it's also the question of where you have to find out where the person is on the political spectrum. Um, I mean, I think that to a large extent, the, the liberal forces in Europe are to blame for the rise of the right wing because they are the ones that destroyed the labor markets. They are the ones that let the corporations rule the game. So I think that's, a, that's quite a nice way to, to start talking to people. Anything else? Um, how do you uh, reflect on the, right now you have a European election, uh, any indication shows that we will have a, basically a right-wing backslash 
in uh, all over Europe. So um, the, 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 the question I, I'm trying to find an answer to is whether the techno-optimistic movement and we probably are in a location where we are more or less a little bit technic optimistic, um, whether it is not having the right reflection on the last battle the movement lost, basically the, the um, Urheberrechtsnovelle. Mm -hmm. So, DM, let's ex explain from a very provincial uh, point of view. I'm from Stuttgart and we don't know much about DiEM25 or any movement that is trying to be dynamic and pr progressive in a technological sense and so on. So, aren't you sure that you're living in a, in a bubble right now where you will wonder after the European elections that we do not cover the important issues to, to stop the backla backlash? Technology and po uh, our program around technology is definitely not enough. This is just one pillar out of many, and the questions that we have to address are obviously very interlinked and complex, so we need to talk about the green transition, we need to talk about workers' rights, we need to talk about anti-discrimination, um, and sometimes these might be easier questions to, to, to address when talking to people that are considering voting for extreme right. Uh, but at the same time, technology has become, much like climate change, uh, something that is making people scared, that it is too complex and too difficult to understand, and there are these greater forces, and there's actually some studies that show that it is exactly technology and climate change that are these forces in people's lives that they're too big and too difficult to understand, that when the right wing comes and simplifies it, they feel comfort, they feel stability. So what we're trying to do with the, with the New Deal for Europe and the New Deal for technology is not to simplify this technology, but it's to, to overcome this fear and to make sure that the when we talk about the solutions, they are easy to translate for things that everybody can understand. And I think that this is, this is something there where we have to make a bridge. We have to, I, th I think we have gotten much better at it, uh, but we have to really, make sure that the, the, the policies that we have can answer. Uh, when I talk to people on the streets, the questions are usually, what about um, sec my security on the internet? This is the most common question because people are just don't understand but feel completely insecure. And the second most common question is, oh, you're, uh, you know this thing about internet, how do I protect my kids? And actually, we don't have answers to either of these questions in this paper, but this is somehow the entry point because people are feeling very insecure and this is where the right wing comes in and says we have the solutions. We have to come in and say have we have different solutions and they're easy and they're, they're realistic and they can be implemented tomorrow. Are there any more questions? Thank you. Thank you.